Hello and welcome. This is Spotlight Ukraine. Trends, world politics and deep analytics made by Ukrainian journalists to the whole globe. Winter has come. What is the situation at the front line? What help to expect from the countries after this summit in Bucharest? Life in outages. How Ukrainian doctors work in extreme conditions of total blackouts. And the latest news made by Russian propaganda. This is Spotlight Ukraine. More of this right now. Russian enemy continues its armed aggression against our state. In order to prevent the advance of Ukrainian soldiers in Svatova and Liman directions, the enemy is carrying out engineering equipment of the defense line. Russia continues the movement of personnel, ammunition and fuel to equip and support new units, as well as those that have suffered losses. More of this in our review. Ukraine-Russia war map, fighting overview, November the 25th, December the 2nd. Southern Front, artillery duels in which Ukraine's armed forces continue to destroy key concentrations of the invading Russian forces along the volnovakha melitopol railway line continue in this direction. They struck Chernihivka and Melitopol again and also destroyed the Russian troops base in Polohi. In Starobogdanivka, the Ukrainian military hit a key railway bridge. A feature of this week was a series of strikes near Energodar. At the same time, the Russian forces began to show signs of a goodwill gesture from the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Invading Russian forces are constantly shelling liberated Kherson from the other bank of the Dnipro River, so pushing the enemy further east is a priority task. On the Dnipro's left bank, the Ukrainian defense forces continue to create a 10-20 kilometer buffer zone, destroying all enemy forces still within artillery range. This week, the Ukrainian armed forces demilitarized Russian military bases and warehouses in Novokakhovka, Golopristany, Novosburyivka and Radensk, as well as destroyed two enemy control centers in Skadovsk and Babine. Instead, HIMARS systems hit the military base in Chaplinka for the fourth time. The Russian enemy still continues to move their administration and collaborators from Novokakhovka to Henichesk, where they formed a new supply route through the Arabat Spit. At the same time, Russian troops are still hiding in the floodplains of the Dnipro River and on the islands, holding back the Ukrainian land and force. Donetsk region. The weather affects the course of military operations. The equipment gets stuck in the swamp, but this does not prevent the Russian enemy from recklessly sending mobilized soldiers into frontal attacks on Ukrainian fortified areas in the Donetsk region. Luhansk region. The fighting in the Luhansk region continued without any advance on either side. Up to 200 artillery strikes are carried out by the Russian occupiers on Bakhmut, Donetsk region, every single day. This figure is voiced by the Ukrainian military. Now this is the hottest point on the front. Fierce fighting has been ongoing here for the past few weeks. Although the Russians greatly outnumber the Ukrainian defenders, they cannot take Bakhmut. In addition to constant enemy shelling, the weather conditions are a serious test for the Ukrainian military. It's now the rainy season in Donbas region, and this is significantly slows down both sides. I still have to clean my shoes now. I had my legs stuck in a swamp up to my knees. It rained heavily, and our trenches were so flooded that we had to scoop water with our hands. Look at the conditions we live in. The boys are resting after their shifts. Like a five-star hotel room. 
Russian propaganda channels constantly report on the successes of their troops in this direction. The Ukrainian military denies this information. Bakhmut is an important transport hub and capture of the city would allow the Russians to launch an offensive on Kramatorsk and Slovyansk. But for now, the city is like an impregnable fortress for them. Very fierce battles are being fought for Bakhmut. According to the scale of destruction, Bakhmut is already being compared with Mariupol. When the shells fall close, it's really scary, but not that much when they are far. About 15,000 civilians, including more than 300 children, still remain in the city and suburbs, the police say. Good afternoon. Who wants to evacuate? Take me, please. Despite the fierce fighting, free evacuation continues for all who want to leave. They were shooting yesterday, and there was another terrible shelling this morning. There is no water supply, electricity or gas in Bakhmut. Residents hardly leave their basements due to constant shelling. Food is cooked on a fire near the houses, but it's always a mortal danger. Residents of Bakhmut survive thanks to humanitarian aid, but despite the unbearable conditions, many of them don't want to leave their hometown. Urmas Reinsalo, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Estonia, joins me now. Hello and welcome. Hello, good evening. Good evening, you too. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg said that Ukraine would one day join the Western military alliance. Is it just words as it was in 2008 summon in Bucharest, or there is a concrete roadmap this time? There ought to be a concrete roadmap. And this is an issue I raised in the uh, Wednesday's NATO foreign ministers meeting when I said that uh, uh, 14 years have passed, and now we have started among the Allies to work out a concrete uh, roadmap to start the dialogue between the Allies. And uh, my, I stated that uh, a precondition of uh, future European security architecture will be first, Ukrainian victory. Secondly, uh, um, Russia, which has no control uh, and influence over its neighbors' security options or way of life. And thirdly, uh, as coming out of that, uh, Ukraine, which uh, is a member of NATO. Oh, yeah, I see. So it's it's pretty, pretty clear map, roadmap. But Hungarian Foreign Minister Pere Siatro uh, confirms that Budapest will block Kiev's participation in official meetings of the Ukraine-NATO Commission. So what NATO will do with such a position of Budapest? Is Hungary Russia's Trojan horse inside now, NATO right now? Many allies also around the NATO ministers' table uh, called that uh, there is an imminent need to... Uh, uh, launch these uh, NATO-Ukrainian uh, councils again. And uh, this is an issue we need strongly to address uh, also uh, towards Hungary. But NATO is a consensus-based organization, and we have to work on that road that, uh, uh, in a larger perspective, all the current uh, NATO members will win if uh, NATO is going uh, wider and uh, well, Ukrainian bravery has shown uh, what Ukrainian, Ukrainian soldiers are capable to do, and this is going to be in future also uh, uh, valuable uh, also to all NATO military and security capabilities. Yeah, okay, thank you. And the last question, what is the exact help from Estonia to Ukraine uh, during the struggling winter times? Now, the most critical issue is surely uh, energy infrastructure. We are going to provide generators, transformers uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we are going to send also a, a winter equipment uh, to Ukrainian soldiers and uh, also an additional uh, military uh, aid package uh, to Ukraine. And uh, this is most important that there are like two sides. Uh, this. Uh, one side is 
giving a humanitarian help and help to uh, sustain the civic infrastructure. But in the meantime, it's most uh, important also that allies will uh, deliver to Ukraine also uh, such weapons uh, that uh, Ukraine can use as a shield, as air defense, but also as a sword, as long-range missiles and particularly tanks, what President Zelensky and also Foreign Minister Kuleba clearly stated. And also particularly, we are going to deliver also uh, already now third uh, uh, compact uh, military hospital. Thank you so much and thank you for your help and support on behalf of Spotlight Ukraine and all the Ukrainians. That was Urmas Reinsalo, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Estonia. And this is Spotlight Ukraine. Like, share and subscribe. We continue. Under the whistling of bullets, risking their own lives, they take people out of the frontline areas. The conductors of the evacuation trains see thousands of refugees. Sometimes they soothe, feed, advise where to go. About the weekdays of Ukrazaliznitsi employees who work on the route Zaporizhzhia Lviv in our next story. On February the 27th, conductor Natalia Kudrich went on the first evacuation flight Zaporizhzhia Lviv and has been working on such routes ever since. It was terrifying to go, but it is our job. I remember when the explosion started, many people were so scared that they rushed under the train. We managed to carry 200 or 250 people along with their luggage and pets in a compartment car designed for 36 people. The trains were repeatedly fired upon, the conductor recalls. During the shelling, when the train is moving, we close all the windows, making the light masking. We never stop in such situations. If the train slows down, the passengers immediately go into panic, as any stop often means the end for them. Natalia remembered the Kyiv Lviv route the most when Russian rockets hit a building near the capital's main station. It was in March. People were knocking on the windows asking to take them all, but we just filled the carriages and left. Two children aged seven and eight boarded the train with their mother still remaining on the platform. Sitting like kittens in a corner, they were soothing each other. We knew their mom boarded the next train, so we watched the children. Now the evacuation is much calmer than in the first months of the full-scale war, says the conductor. There are fewer trains, because there aren't so many people who are living. Oleksandr and Margarita from Avdivka. At home is constant shelling, they say, but the unknown is no less frightening. We have no one to turn to. We want to find a house and work and just survive this war. So that the evacuees don't feel alone with their problems, volunteers are waiting for them at the stations around the clock. They will tell you where to find free shelter and help. Retired U.S. Army Major John Spencer, the chair of Urban Warfare Studies at Modern War Institute at West Point, joins Spotlight Ukraine. Hello and welcome. Hello. How can the world bring Putin to justice? Uh, that, that's going to be tough. Um, the, I think the first start would be kick him out of any multi-international organization until he changes his behavior. I think there's a, the world can impose more sanctions than have already been imposed. There's lots that can be done just by informing the Russian people what the Russians are doing in Ukraine, um, whether they're listening or not. But there's many actions. No, number one is um, to go in 100 percent with helping Ukraine remove Russian military from its sovereign land, that will send a clear enough message to the people that back Putin, which he has very few friends. Do the sanctions against Putin's regime imposed by, uh, by West uh, work now? Absolutely. I mean, some of them are, are short-term sanctions, and some of them are, are more long-term sanctions, like the sanctions on technologies. And, and this is what we're seeing has resulted in um, limited military capability to refurbish. I mean, the damage that Putin is doing to his to the Russian state will take generations to repair. Could there be more sanctions? Could there be sanctions on the man himself? Absolutely. Can there be more to be done? Absolutely. Could you designate Russia a terrorist state? Absolutely. There's lots more that can be done. Sanctions, there's a great variety of them, but yeah, they're having an impact for sure. 
Uh, the European Parliament has stated Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Is there going to be a step number two or three? What does it mean? Yeah, that's a tough call. I mean, I think the step two should be that all nations, not just the European organizations, all nations should do that because it comes with very specific sanctions that can be imposed on uh, nations that work with Russia, Russian uh, companies. It means a lot. Um, so I think step two is that follow that lead. Uh, the U.S. and other countries need to follow that lead. Now, let's talk about the winter, because the winter has come, a very tough winter for Ukrainians. And uh, the situation at the front line is also tough. Uh, who's more prepared for the winter, Ukrainian army or Russians uh, in the opposite? Uh, that's, that's an easy one. Of course, the Ukrainians are going to be more prepared. Um, they have stronger interior lines. The Ukrainian leadership cares about their soldiers. They'll be rotating them in from the cold. They'll be ensuring that they're equipped with all the right equipment. Um, and it's almost the polar opposite with the Russians. The Russians don't have the winter clothing, the winterized equipment. Um, they don't have the capability to rotate their forces. They don't have the training. Um, this is going to have a huge impact on the Russian soldiers. And I hope more of them answer the call to just surrender because clearly their nation doesn't care about them and is going to allow them to suffer greatly. Of course, my concern is also the Ukrainian civilians since Russia has basically turned weather into WMD and is terrorizing the Ukrainian people. But the Ru Ukrainian yeah. soldiers are strong, and, and this is going to impact the Russians way more. If I'm not mistaken, but Hodges stated that uh, Ukraine can uh, return Crimea till the end of the next year. Do you believe in this? Is it possible? Absolutely. I, I believe and I have hope. Um, I, I, have, I believe the Ukrainians can reclaim all of their territories, reestablish their 1991 sovereign borders. I know they can, and, and that's, if that's the path that the Ukrainian people will take, then, then they'll achieve it. Yes, and um, one more question. Putin has changed his plans in, in, in this war, so now he is uh, uh, fighting against the civilians in Ukraine. Am I right? Absolutely. I mean, is he successful in this? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and there should be more be, to be done to take that last desperate act of, of Putin away from him, his ability to strike at the Ukrainian people, since he can't, his military can't have success on the battlefield. This is a a tactic of weakness. This is showing his weakness that he's doing this, but the, the world should support more to stop it from continuing. Um, and, and you know, I don't 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 let the Russian media say that Putin made a decision to do this. Um, he was forced to do this because he's losing. He lost this war back in April, and he's losing every day. And the Ukrainians are, are just never going to be defeated. Some experts say that there's a shortage of the uh, military help at the stores in, in the European countries and the United States as well. What can be done to help Ukrainian army during the winter time? Do we'll, uh, will we have enough uh, power to win this war? I think so. I mean, the superpower of Ukraine is its alliances and its partnerships with the West. And we've seen this already with the response of the West just this last week in the meeting of the NATO foreign ministers on you know, Ukraine had, knows what it needs. And then the world responds in rushing generators or military aid. Um, of course, it can always be more, but there, you know, a nation's ability to fight is its means and its will. Because Ukraine has so many alliances, because its war is just, its reason for fighting is just, that, that aid is rushing in there. And I, I'm very hopeful it'll get there as, as quick as it can, because even the United States, one of its powers is not just its military, but its ability to move stuff quickly. And we need that stuff to get there quickly. Thank you. Will Ukraine join NATO? Because now it seems like a flashback to 2008, just talks and talks and talks. I mean, I, it, there are conditions um, about you know not being in an active conflict, but I absolutely believe that it'll be the UN asking NATO. Or it, let's say this: it'll be Ukraine that is asked to join NATO, not the other <laughs> way around. Because Ukraine is coming out of this, the strongest, one of the strongest countries in Europe by every definition. So I I, I look forward to Ukraine joining the NATO alliance, and 
and being a, one of the strongest countries in the member states. Um, you know that Heimar says they, they, that if they have changed the situation at the front line. Do we have to expect more Heimarses? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think there was a, a, a recent part of that package, not only the HIMARS, but also the HIMARS rockets, um, keeping that supply. And I, I agree that most of the world was cut off balance. And this is why, again, Ukraine is helping the world prepare for what it needs to, to deter Russia. So you need a military industrial base that can produce these weapons that are having such success at a faster rate. So there is some of that uh, having to be done. So they need more HIMARS, but they also need more HIMARS ammunition. After all, Putin has already done. Can he be right now the goal number one? Can he do what? Well, after, after all Putin has done already, can he be like the goal tag, uh, target number one? Can he achieve his number one goal? Or is he, no, no, should no, he the be target, the target? target. Can Putin be target number one right now in the world? Like bin Laden? Like terrorist oh, number one. Uh, ab so, uh, so it's it's Putin has spent decades achieving the power that he has. Um, I think it's the Russian people that need to make that decision that he is not right for the Russian state. He is sending Russia back a generation, a hundred years. I mean, it's the Russian people and the people around him that need to ensure that they can't continue and live in prosperity with him in charge. And that's for sure. What would be the end for Putin and the bunker? <laughs> That's right. Um, will we find him in a bunker? Uh, <laughs> I, I personally think um, the end for him, of course, step one is a complete. Um, he's already been completely militarily defeated in Ukraine. It is the greatest embarrassment of a nation since World War II. Um, he thought he could overtake Ukraine in a couple of days. And, in his second most powerful army in the world on paper was shown to be wanting. Um, so he's already lost strategically so much. The future for him is that he'll never have the power that he once did. And that's, again, how Ukraine is helping the world. It is ensuring that the Russian military and Putin can never do a war of aggression like this again on Ukraine or any of his neighbors. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Slava Ukraini. John Spencer, the chair uh, of Urban Warfare Studies at Modern War Institute at West Point, was the guest of Spotlight Ukraine. And now we continue. When life depends on electricity, power outages are extremely dangerous for hospital patients. So every medical facility that provides emergency care has not one, but several generators. But there are situations when doctors have to perform extremely complex operations with candles or forehead flashlights. How doctors cope with new challenges, see in our material. With headlamps and to the sounds of explosions, this is how 14 years old David is operated on at the Heart Institute. It was when Russia massively bombarded Kiev with missiles, and right during the operation, the lights turned out in the hospital. Prosthetic heart valve. The lights went out. The surgeons continuous. Using headlamps. Please try to finish as soon as possible. We started the generator, but we cannot predict the situation. No one knows what happened, but the lights in the operation theater went completely off. Now we will start the generator, but it will take a few minutes. Rejoice, Russians, rejoice! The child is lying on the operating table, and the light has gone out. When the operation was ending, doctors had to stitch up the patient with phone flashlight, but the operation was completed without complications. Doctors completed the operation successfully. While Russia was launching missile strikes, nine organ transplants had been performed in the first medical center of Lviv. And in the Cherkasy Oncology Hospital, thanks to the electric generator, two kidney transplants were performed. 
Ukrainian doctors have already adapted to work in extremely difficult conditions. The intensive care unit for newborns in this Lviv hospital was set up in the basement, which also serves as a shelter in case of alarm. The lives of all these children depend on medical equipment. These children were born prematurely. They have many problems and pathologies and accordingly require very serious treatment, including artificial respiration, monitoring of their functions. That is, the patients who were born sick are the most difficult. All the equipment can work and batteries for several hours, but if the lights are turned off, it doesn't even take five minutes for everything to switch to the generator. And fortunately, we and our patients didn't feel these changes. In case of power failure, the hospital has six powerful generators. They supply electricity to all buildings, but priority is given to children's and reception departments and operating rooms. As a rule, the backup power is activated automatically, immediately as soon as the light disappears. But different things happen. Once the lights went out during the final stage of the surgery and the doctors had to stitch up the patient using their phone flashlights as the generator had not yet started, the surgery was completed with no complications. Hospital energy workers have a very responsible task. They must constantly replenish diesel stocks and monitor the level of voltage in the network, which is now lower than necessary due to the deficit in the country's power system. There are big problems with the voltage now. We had to connect a diesel generator once even when there was light. Because hemodialysis could not work due to the lack of voltage, lives of people are at the stake. Medical institutions aren't subject to the power outage introduced in Ukraine, but when the Russian occupiers launch massive rocket attacks on energy facilities, electricity also disappears in hospitals. This is a colossal challenge. Of course, sometimes anything may not work. It shouldn't be like that. But in such a terrible time when so many innocent people and our defenders are dying, we must overcome all these challenges. Due to problems with electricity, doctors often have to postpone planned operations, but emergency operations, on which the lives of patients depend, are carried out regardless of the conditions. Gnad Garic, MD, PhD Chief of Surgery Department, Multidisciplinary Clinical Hospital of Emergency and Intensive Care, joins me now. Hello. Hello. So now we're talking about the extreme conditions Ukrainian doctors provide surgeries uh, in terms of the total blackouts. How can a hospital function without electricity? Um, so it's a big problem for Ukraine and especially for Ukrainian healthcare system because uh, really we have problem with the infrastructure and with the electricity supply. Uh, nowadays, we have already uh, in the biggest hospitals of the Ukraine and is also in our hospital uh, the special um, the special uh, thing that we can use is like the electronic generators. But uh, also sometimes when the electricity from the uh, like the um, uh, electricity supply change for the generators, electric, electric uh, diesel generators. It, tame, it takes sometimes a few minutes or seconds, so it's a really problem. So what is happening during that, you just said, seconds or minutes, if you have already started the surgery? What is happening over there? It's a big problem because uh, when it's happening, we need to, um, like, we, we adapted already for this. We used the headlights um, um, to operate because the biggest problem, if at that moment we have some internal bleeding or um, some intra some like mini invasive operation, it's like the laparoscopic operation and like that. So, at that case, it's a, a really big problem for us. But we already um, adapted for this. So, 
what is the adaptation in such conditions? So what, what do you do exactly? You just wait or you continue making surgeries? Now we have possibility to continue the surgery with using these headlights and like this. And I think after the few weeks, we already will have the, um, this time for the changing the system from the um, uh, city electricity supply for the generator supply just for a few seconds. It will be the best way to, um, like, to, um, to change these things uh, better for us, like the sergeants in the operation room. And the last question, is the shortage of generators um, in Ukrainian hospitals big right now? How more do we need? I think we need a lot of it because uh, the supply of the huge and strategic hospital like I am work there uh, in Lviv region is good, but um, we also have a few uh, and a lot of um, many uh, small regional hospital and I think uh, the supply of this hospital not so good. I think some hospital uh, still didn't have the generators, so it's very important to help Ukraine and especially the health care system of Ukraine with that. What except of the generations do you need? Is there any shortage or something in Ukrainian hospitals? Um, you ask about the medical stuff yep. at all? Yes, yes, except of generators. Yes, we need uh, really a lot of stuff because every day, uh, 24 hours per day, we have the victims, the civilian and the military uh, patient that coming from the east and from the um, south of the Ukraine with the evacuation trains. And we do a lot of operation every day. We do some very difficult reconstructive operation that uh, only done in the special uh, reconstructive centers. And this operation needs very specific and high expensive supply that we only can have from the West countries. So um, uh, mostly it's the uh, drugs and the specific surgery supply for the operation. Oh, yeah, I see. Nevertheless, thank you so much for your help and uh, for your job. Uh, Nad Garic, Ukrainian thank surgeon you. and real hero, was the guest of Spotlight Ukraine. Thank you once again, and we continue. How Kremlin prepares Russians for the Ukrainian liberation of Crimea and the new fakes Moscow makes to demoralize civilians next in our weekly review. One onslaught after another, Russian missiles keep destroying Ukraine's critical infrastructure. Administration of cities working non-stop to restore electricity. In Kyiv, they have said repair work on the power grid is in its final phase after the latest Kremlin attack. Russia's main aim is not just to leave Ukrainians in darkness, but to break the spirit. So after seeing how quickly and gradually Ukraine is re-establishing light and heat in homes, Russians also resort to informational attacks. Apocalypse in the dark. Cities of Ukraine plunged into the Middle Ages. Looters rob and kill on the streets. Residents of Kyiv and Lviv on social networks are preparing to rob supermarkets and discuss pogroms. In this piece by the Russian tabloid Komsomolskaya Pravda, Kremlin's propagandists state Ukrainians are robbing flats of each other, kidnapping foreigners to demand a ransom, and stealing wet wipes from shops so to use instead of showering. Interesting that so-called journalists do not name sources they receive information from, probably because when you trump up a story, you do not get the chance to have sources except your imagination. Meanwhile, Ukrainians buy generators to supply themselves with electricity, equip homes with portable charges and help each other. Zelensky had back and refused plans to attack Crimea. This is the title of a news piece by Russian Tsargrad TV. Kremlin media spread in manipulative news about Ukraine allegedly changed its mind about returning the temporarily occupied Crimea. 
According to the Financial Times, Zelensky has resigned himself to the fact that Russian soldiers will not leave the peninsula, so Kyiv should not waste time conquering it by force. Information Russia states is allegedly based on an interview with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to the Financial Times. However, Zelensky did not say anything about Ukraine's intentions to refuse the liberation of Crimea. On the contrary, the president emphasized there would be no lasting peace in Ukraine as long as the Russian occupation of any piece of Ukrainian territory continues. Moscow does not take the European Parliament's decision of recognizing the Russian Federation as a state sponsor of terrorism seriously. A Russian daily broadsheet newspaper is Vestia states. Also, Russian politicians and so-called experts believe there will be no legal consequences for Moscow. The EU does not have a legal basis for granting such status to third states. At the same time, the same resolution in response should have been adopted against the NATO countries. At the moment, the European Union really does not have a legal framework that allows for the introduction of serious restrictive measures against a country recognized as a sponsor of terrorism. However, the essence of the resolution of the European Parliament is to create such an international legal framework. The main purpose of this resolution is to reflect the current situation Russia is using the mythos of terrorists and financing them. The resolution should be a political and moral statement that will change the perception of the Russian government and establish it as a criminal regime that uses the worst methods. Belarus, a close ally of Russia, which has supported the Russian invasion of Ukraine, now helps Kremlin to strengthen its propaganda system. Belarusian Border Committee said Ukrainians are massively fleeing from Ukraine to Belarus by using other countries as transit. Over the past week, more than 1,300 citizens of Ukraine entered our country, and all of them were in transit through the EU countries. Fake about the mass migration of Ukrainians to Belarus was revealed by Stanislav Zharin, Commissioner of the Government for the Security of the Information Space of Poland. A number of Ukrainian refugees are falsified on the graphics as if they were driven to Belarus. Zharin noted that Belarusian propaganda hints that Ukrainians fleeing Russian aggression seek refuge in Belarus, perceiving this country as a safer than European Union countries. And now, let's discuss the global politics with our global news editor, Yuri Fieser, who's already in the studio. Yuri, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Volodymyr. So, one of the main events that took place uh, during the last seven days, spotlighting Ukraine. Well, I have to say that uh, another week of struggle for Ukraine's independence uh, has passed. This struggle continued on the battlefields where brave Ukrainian soldiers and officers fought for with against uh, Russian invaders. But uh, this uh, struggle also continued on the diplomatic front lines. Um, politicians, government officials and uh, diplomats uh, from all around the globe uh, have also been busy this uh, week uh, deciding how to help us in fighting Russian aggression. So much news, but can you name the major one? Yes, I can. First, uh, diplomats gathered in the um, capital of Poland, the city of Warsaw, a meeting of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe was held there. Representatives of uh, different countries met to discuss and resolve important issues for the organization. Among other things, uh, they talked about the need to reorganize the work of the OSCE, in particular during the Russian war in Ukraine. That is, one of the main questions was uh, as follows. Can representatives of the aggressor state which started this war participate in the meeting of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe? This issue uh, of supporting Ukraine was also among 
the main ones. And this is what uh, about uh, the support for Ukraine, the president of the OSCE, Parliamentary Assembly, Mrs. Uh, Margareta Sederfeld, said in her introductory speech. Since then, there have been nine months of terror and destruction. Millions of plagues in the dark and the cold. Cities destroyed. Thousands of Ukrainians buried and robbed. Victims of war. Millions of displaced or deported Ukrainians. But Ukraine is strong. Ukraine stands strong. And our assembly stands with Ukraine. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, the host country of this meeting, Mr. Zbigniew Rao, said that in addition to words about helping Ukraine, the country's members of the OSCE must show this help in action and not to appease the aggressor. This is what Mr. Rao said. Ladies and gentlemen, if our ultimate goals are to defend and preserve peace and to build confidence and expand our cooperation, then it is this that should guide the OEC and its individual actors in the choices we make. However, keeping the organization cannot be an end in itself. No, do I think that appeasement and giving a free pass to aggression and violence can be the means to preserve the organization either. And Volodymyr, I must say that maybe one of the strongest speeches during this meeting came from the leader of the United Kingdom's delegation to the OSCE, Mr. Mark Pritchard. Uh, he briefly and very clearly said what West should do in order to help us to win the war. Let us hear Mr. Pritchard. So this war is not just restricted to Ukraine. It is impacting millions of people in our own countries and beyond even the membership of this organization. And it is likely to get worse rather than better unless we take action. We have a choice in this assembly to continue to just offer warm words and motions and platitudes, which are important and have their place in diplomacy. But to add to that, three words, weapons, 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 in order to achieve peace, peace, peace. It's pretty clear. Yes. More weapons. Weapons, weapons. For the peace. Peace, peace, peace. Yep. And now, Volodymyr, we have the head of the Ukrainian delegation to the OSCE, Mr. Maketa Poturayev. Mr. Poturayev, do you hear us? Yes, perfectly well. I'm glad to be with you. Thanks for joining us. If you don't mind, I will, we will hear what you said uh, during this meeting uh, a week ago, and then I will ask questions, okay? Great. So, let's hear. So, colleagues, I ask you to support this very principle for the future of this organization decision. <laughs> and to change rules and procedures so that we as organization for security and cooperation can show that we can protect security and we can fight for cooperation so as ukraine now is fighting for freedom and democracy because if we are not able even to suspend membership of aggressor state for us ukrainian delegation it will be unfortunately a necessity to think about suspension of our membership so mr hmm. poturai my first question to you will be as follows did your colleagues in the osce Parliamentary Assembly agree with what you said. I mean, did they suspend membership of the uh, Russian delegation? Unfortunately not. It was um, no, very um, 
uh, sort of surprise for us, a very bad surprise. Uh, of course, we, we received messages uh, during first days of um, work of uh, assembly, uh, but we, uh, and yeah, well, principally we were, um, we were prepared to what uh, uh, happened uh, during uh, standing committee. But of course we, uh, and nobody from Ukraine could be prepared to hear uh, absolutely unacceptable things uh, from uh, members of Senate Committee. Uh, so, like, for example, uh, Swiss delegation, uh, Netherlands delegation, for our surprise, uh, Finnish uh, delegation, uh, part of uh, German delegation, part of French delegation, Cyprus delegation. Uh, you know, they are uh, told uh, to, to, to all uh, delegations that we can't close the window, we can't close the door, we should uh, have dialogue with the Russians, we, we all have to communicate with Russians. Now, people, people even, uh, and, and, and I think that it's, it's a real problem for OECPA and, and in general uh, for, for Europe. Even considering uh, right decisions that were uh, taken on uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly or Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, but still there are a lot of uh, such uh, thoughts that, but at the same time we have to communicate, we have to talk with Russians, we have to discuss with them something. I told that I'm not going, and we, uh, as members of Ukrainian delegations, we are not going to discuss with cannibals uh, aspects of the taste of human meat. So we don't understand what to discuss with the Russians. And the problem that I started with is that they even don't understand how it is immoral to meet with people who said many times that all Ukrainians should be killed, that every people who speak Ukrainian language should be killed, that there is no Ukrainian nation, there is no Ukrainian language, there is no Ukrainian culture. All, practically all, 99% of members of Russian delegation uh, made such statements in their media many times and how are they going to meet with them and what are they going to discuss with them ukrainian delegation as i've mentioned uh, is not going to meet and debate and discuss with russians anything so we can come if russians what i don't believe in any case but if russians will say that we are coming to negotiate something concrete. So in, the, in that case, we will go to our president, we will go to our minister of foreign affairs, we will tell them that there is a proposal from Russians through OECP to negotiate some concrete things. If we have mandate, we'll go, we meet, and we will negotiate. But, uh... Uh, if, we, if we have if we have instructions. But we are not going to go to Vien or any other city and just to meet with them in the whole, in the meeting room. You understand? Yes? Yeah, that's, that's, that's so, pretty, so, pretty so, clear. So we, we, are no, we are not going to dispute with these, I don't know, creatures. But still... And again, uh, and, and again, all these all this talks that Look, all wars should be ended by negotiations. No. Major part of wars was ended by capitulations. Yes, there are different types of capitulation. Uh, and really, there can be negotiations about terms of capitulation. So in such negotiations, the Ukrainian delegation is ready to take part you know, to discuss terms of Russian capitulation. But we're not going to discuss with them anything else. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that is pretty clear. But still in this situation, 
Is OSCE ready to support organizing a special tribunal for Russian Federation? Look, there is, uh, well, it's, it's, not, it's not a market. They said that they are ready, but it, it, it's, it, it's not something that uh, I would trade. So if they are ready to support a special tribunal, okay, please support. But it's not a change. Okay, we will organize or we will support tribunal, but please come and uh, discuss something with Russians. No, it's not our case. If you want to support tribunal, please support it. Mr. It's Putur separate. It's separate act, you know. Mr. Puturayan, and one last question from me. Does OSC as an, an institution have any practical meaning for us right now in this current situation? Uh, unfortunately, very few meanings. Uh, and I think that this situation is an absolutely clear case to start uh, well, discussing, uh, at least discussing, deep reform of this international organization. Because if, it is, if it's not able to reform itself and to apply even weakest sanction against aggressor, it means that this organization has no future. And then Ukraine, together with our allies, will raise the question of prob possible, possible organizing new organization, which is able to support and to provide security and cooperation in Europe. Thank you, Mr. Potoraya. Thank you for being with us today. This and was a very emotional discussion. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. This was Mikita Potoraya, the head of the Ukrainian delegation uh, to the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. And uh, what else? Has another happened? important meeting uh, took place in Kiev uh, a few days ago. The ministers of the foreign affairs uh, of the Scandinavian and Baltic countries came to our country. The biggest group of ministers from Nordic and Baltic states, namely from um, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland, came to Kiev. On November 28th, the main topic of discussion was the strengthening of Ukraine's support. Ministers expressed full solidarity with Ukraine and made a number of statements regarding further assistance to Kyiv, the supply of air defense and missile defense systems to Ukraine, strengthening of sanctions against Russia, the demilitarization of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and the work of grain corridors. Then, together with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, and Metro Kuleba, they left for the NATO summit in Bucharest. And then we'll talk about NATO summit in Bucharest. Helping Ukraine to restore critical infrastructure facilities uh, after massive Russian rock shell, uh, rocket shells. According to the Secretary General, General of the North Atlantic Alliance, Jens Stoltenberg, this was the main topic at the meeting of NATO states foreign ministers. The meeting took place on November 29-30 in the capital of Romania, Bucharest. In particular, the member states of this military political union will continue to help restore gas and energy infrastructure facilities. Moreover, they will continue to give us means of air defense. Mr. Stoltenberg also emphasized that Ukraine has already received large-scale assistance from NATO, but it is necessary to mobilize even more, since shelling of important objects in Ukraine may continue. Unfortunately, it may continue, and we have to be ready yep. for this. And we need this help from our allies and partners from the West. And we are now joined, as far as I understand, by Mr. Tomasz Zdechowski. He is a member of the European Parliament, rep, uh, uh, European Parliament and he represents Czech Republic. Mr. Zdechowski, uh, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure every time to join and support the Ukraine people. Mr. Zakhovsky, thank you for your help and for your support. The German Bundestag recognized the Holodomor of 1932-1933 as a genocide of Ukrainian people. The resolution was adopted in Berlin by a majority vote. 
As far as I understand and remember, Czech Republic adopted the same resolution in April. My question to you is as follows. I do understand why it is important for Ukrainians, but why it is important for Europeans, at least for some? Listen, this is very important. Make any political statement about situation in your country. And I think that genocide, what is uh, Russia systematically trying to do, uh, is uh, very important to present it to the uh, to the uh, European so society, and it's very necessary have it common position in all European um, European countries and present it to the to the media and speak about it because Russians are doing systematically genocide of Ukraine people. And we have to be absolutely clear and repeat it that it's genocide like Turkey did against the Armenian, like the Nazis did against the uh, Jewish people or people with Jewish origin. Also, this is the same principle and in the 21th century is absolutely unacceptable. Thank you. And um, I got another question. So last week was quite a busy week in Europe. There were quite a few meetings held in different parts of the continent, and Russian threat was one of the main topics, if not the main one. So does Europe have enough patience to continue to stay with Ukraine, to stand with Ukraine until our victory? Yes, you can trust us that we have it the, the same position for, for the future. Also, we will stay with Ukraine people and we will stay with you. We are as a brothers and sisters. And this is what I am saying. I am saying it from my heart. And I will tell you that many of my colleagues have its same position. Also, we will not let you go. We will not help the Russia to be owner of the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine people. Also, we are absolutely clear. We want to support Ukraine to win this war. Uh, Mr. Zakhovsky, and one more question to you from me. The European Union, as far as I understand, started to work on the ninth package of anti-Russian sanctions. Uh, do you maybe know which sanctions can be in this package? And I suspect that you know. <laughs> yes, you know it very well. This is why you are calling me. This is, the, you know that I know uh, many background information, but most important things that we are trying to put on the sanction list, the people who are really responsible for the genocide in, in Ukraine. And I think that uh, we have to take really much more stronger action against these people. And uh, I think that we have, we need to have it the concrete sanction not only against the, the uh, industry parts, but we need to have it concrete sanction against people who are responsible for the Russian propaganda and for the uh, Russian genocide in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and for taking part in our program. This was uh, Tomasz, De Tomasz Dechowski, the member of the European Parliament representing Czech Republic. And we continue discussing the major events that has happened in the global politics uh, during the last seven days. And if I'm not mistaken, one of the main events has happened in China. Oh, yeah. It's too far from us. And many people, at, at least here in Ukraine, think that China is too far from yep. Ukraine. Maybe it's not interesting for us, but it's very interesting for us. Something very unusual, and I would even say strange, happened oh. in uh, uh, China uh, this a few weeks ago. A few for, 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 for a few weeks, protests in the celestial empire are not just abating, they are gaining momentum and spreading to new cities every day. Despite the ban, the Chinese continue to hold mass protests. In such a manner, they express disagreement with the draconian methods by which the Chinese leadership is trying to contain the spread of the coronavirus disease COVID-19. Thousands of people were detained throughout the country to this dissatisfaction with the country 
country's leadership was added, people chant slogans like Xi Jinping, go away, and Communist Party, go away. But Ukrainians are also worried by the information that during the past weeks, Russian transport planes were very often flew to China. Uh, what did they bring back? And does this mean that Beijing finally decided to join Russian war in Ukraine? Hmm. So far, I cannot answer this question. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, let's wait and see. And so it's all for now in my part of Spotlight Ukraine. Volodymyr, uh, see you next week and back to you. Thank you for your job and we're waiting uh, just in one week for the global news from you. Yuri Fizer, our global news editor, we were just discussing the global politics and this is Spotlight Ukraine. We continue. Stay with us. Joking during long-lasting power outages, creating memes about darkness and fighting Russian propaganda with humor. So let's see what it's new with Ukrainian social media ongoing week. Ukraine suffers electricity outages. Temporary blackouts have been a daily occurrence in all the country's regions. Local authorities have created schedules for when lights go off. While Russia waits for Ukrainians to surrender, they are not even close to it. And as always, love so as not to cry. When you live in a country that is being bombed every day, and whole city is without electricity today. But nothing can stop you from going to a date. However, even so Ukraine does have a power outage schedule, sometimes lights go off unexpectedly. Ukraine's grid operator Ukranergo says that emergency power cuts were being enacted in all Ukrainian regions after widespread Russian attacks. Watch this. Number 664 will be going on right about now. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Number 672, right now. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. There are cases when people are left with no electricity for the whole day. In order to help citizens, authorities have introduced points of invincibility. When massive Russian strikes happen again, and if there is an understanding that the electricity supply cannot be restored within hours, the work of points of invincibility, special shelters for all basic services, will be rolled out across Ukraine. President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky emphasized that all necessary and basic services will be available at the points, including electricity, mobile communication, the internet, water, lightning, etc. Except for the whole idea, Ukrainians also liked the project's name a lot. <laughs> DC presented the first Ukrainian comic book superhero, Bleeding Cool Reports. The new makeup of the upcoming Stormwatch superhero team is to be introduced soon, and that it would include Kor, Pavlo Stupka, a new Ukrainian character. Pavlo Stupka is a Ukrainian living nuclear generator with the power of flight, and while he is 52, he looks 16 years old. Nuclear generation really gets rid of those wrinkles, it seems. There is a popular television program called Good Night Little Ones in Russia. It was created during the Soviet era. The presenter is joined on set by one or two puppet characters. The most regularly appearing puppets are Hryusha, which is a piglet, and Stepashka, a hare. So one of the show's presenters, Angelina Vovk, declared she wants to go to the front line to convince the armed forces of Ukraine not to fight. Vovk also believes that with the help of Hryusha and Stepashka, she can force the soldiers to stop their resistance. Yeah, this is the kind of TV show they present for kids in Russia. Meanwhile, Ukrainian social media do have a thing to say about this. In addition to the front on the battlefield, Ukraine has been holding an information front for the 10 months. Journalists shoot reports in hot spots and debunk the myths of Russian propaganda. 
Since the beginning of the full-scale war, more than 40 media workers have died while performing their professional duties or defending Ukraine. The terrorist attacks on the Ukrainian energy system became a serious challenge for the mass media. But turning off the light does not spin the efforts. The Spotlight Ukraine project offers you behind the scenes glimpses of our work right now. 14 hours of live broadcasts every day. In this mode, the Espresso TV channel has been working since the beginning of the full-scale war, so that Ukrainians receive the most prompt information. And our project Spotlight Ukraine tells and analyzes the most important events related to Ukraine for an English-speaking audience. Please, not the least role from the first days of the full-scale invasion. The air raid has started. Let's go to the bomb shelter. The war makes its adjustments. During the air alarm, journalists and hosts head for shelter, but work continues. This is the parking lot of the business center, where all the employees and residents of the entire neighborhood actually hide. When the lights are turned off, electricity is provided by the powerful generators. The field studio of the TV channel is equipped with the necessary equipment and high-speed internet. This allows the host of the program, Volodymyr Ostapchuk, to continue preparing for the broadcast. In case of an air raid alarm, we have a bomb shelter, a bomb studio, as we call it. And there is absolutely everything here for the smooth work even during the air raid alarm, because unfortunately it can last three or even five hours. And if it's not cancelled in 20 minutes, I'll have to work from here. Fortunately, this time the alarm didn't last long and the team returned to the studio. They already used to difficult working days, an editor-in-chief Nazari Volansky says. Despite all the difficulties, we cannot leave our audience without the truth, because one of the goals of Russian aggression is not only to deprive Ukraine of light, but also to deprive the world of the truth. That's why we are working here. Behind me there is a large, powerful team working together, and we are ready to break into the air. For you, our English-speaking talk show is broadcast on YouTube channel Spotlight Ukraine Espresso TV every Friday at 10 p.m. Kyiv time and 9 p.m. Central European time. So stay with us. That was Spotlight Ukraine. Thank you for watching. Like, share and subscribe on our YouTube channel Espresso Spotlight Ukraine. More news during the week. Find out there. See you next Friday. До побачення.